So this semester at Vespers, we've been walking through our series called Good Company, which has been all about navigating different types of relationships. Um, so week one, we talked about our relationship with God, which is the most important relationship that we can ever have. We talked about how it's important to really be secure in our identity in Christ before we think about having any other type of relationship. Um, and that our security and our fullness comes from Christ alone. No other relationship can satisfy us other than Christ. And then next we talked about um, our relationships with our friends and how important it is to have good community in our lives. We talked about this term, a soul friend, which is a friend that knows the deepest parts of you. They know the good things about your life. They know your deepest struggles, your deepest fears and um, they're the people that can call you out and encourage you when you're down. Um, so that was week two. And then we talked about what does it look like to hold our friends accountable and to call our friends back when they're walking in a life of sin and they're um, falling away from Jesus. And how do we hold each other accountable? Because that's super important. Um, and we learned how it can be really harmful to your friend and to the church if we aren't willing to have those bold conversations. And then we talked about how important it was to Jesus to hang out with the people that are outside of the church, how important it is that we invest in relationships outside of our comfort zones and love people that think different than us, look different than us, and um, because that was super important to Jesus. And so that brings us to tonight. Um, I really intentionally thought through uh, each week and how we were going to get to tonight, which is our topic on dating. Um, and that's kind of what inspired this series is a lot of people wanted to talk about dating here at Vespers, but I didn't think we just, just talk about that all semester. I think all of our relationships are really important. And it's important that we think through um, our relationship with God, our relationships with our friends before we get to our relationships with a significant other. And so I want to talk at first about how important it is to think about our relationship with God as we begin a relationship. Um, because if our relationship with God is truly the most important relationship in our life, as it should be, I mean, he's the creator of the universe. He's our Lord and Savior. He is the one who provides us hope. He's our only source of hope in our life, right? So that should be our most important relationship. It should be affecting all areas of our lives. Therefore, we should really care about entering into a relationship with someone who is equally as passionate about the Lord as we are, right? Um, so we're going to read 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18 together going to be up on the screen. Uh, it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and, the, and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, so this verse is not talking specifically about dating and marriage. Uh, spoiler alert, there's nothing in the Bible about dating. Um, dating was not a thing during that time. Your dad would choose who you were going to marry. Um, it would be for financial reasons, um, to help honor your family. You, you wouldn't get a say in who you were going to marry. And so dating wasn't even a thing to think about. But what this verse is talking about, what this passage is talking about is how important it is to think about um, relationships that we enter into in covenants. Um, and covenant relationships 
are not a very um, normal thing in our culture other than marriage, right? Like that's really the only thing we can think of when we think of covenant relationships. But in scripture, in the times of the Bible, in um, ancient times, it would be really normal for you to also have covenant relationships. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about friendships, but people would actually make covenants in their friendships as well. Um, Another context we can think about this is business partners. When you're entering into a business relationship and signing contracts with someone, um, we would think about this text as well. But we're gonna be thinking about this specifically um, in relation to relationships, dating and marriage, and why it's important uh, to be equally yoked. Uh, So yoke, a yoke looks like this. Okay, so it's this big wooden thing that farmers would use to put two animals in. I don't, N- Nels, do you know anything? <laughs> I might butcher this, but yeah, they would put <laughs> my resident farm, farmer right there. <laughs> um, so they would put two animals in these. Most of the time they were an ox or a donkey but you would not want to mix and match your animals because the animals walk at a different pace and the way that their bodies move is different between different types of animals. So you wouldn't want to put, uh, there's actually a law in Deuteronomy uh, twenty-two ten that says, um, do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. So this is a literal law in the Old Testament because it was bad for the animals to be unequally yoked. And it wasn't efficient for you to get your work done. It was painful on the animals. Um, It just, it wasn't a good idea. So they literally had a law about it. So Paul here in 2 Corinthians is speaking in this agricultural language that would really connect with his audience and saying, look, just like you wouldn't put a donkey and an ox together, you don't want to put two people together that are walking at different paces of life in their spiritual journeys, right? Okay, so that's what we're talking about right now, and I want to spend some time at our table talking about this. Um, so I want you together to, someone volunteer at your table to pull out the message version of this text. So 2 Corinthians six fourteen through 18, Read it again at your table in the message version because I think it's really helpful. And then we're going to talk about why do you think this matters in our dating and marriage relationships. Ready? Break. Does anyone want to share what they talked about? Why does this matter in our relationships? Anybody want to be brave? Okay, thanks Haley. I'm Haley, um, this is my group. So we talked about how um, it starts with accountability and kind of like making sure that the other person is going with their path and not like steering away from their own because of you, if that makes sense. And we also talked about how it can be exhausting to the stronger believer to try to pull the other person out of their spot on their own. Cause you can't be that person for them, you know? Yeah, so. for sure. Y'all have anything? Put you on the spot. For my next joke. Anyone else want to share? Um, So we kind of talked about how um, having two believers in a dating relationship is important because if someone who isn't a believer might not have the same values in terms of, let's say, like forgiveness. So if... I'm arguing with my, uh, if I'm arguing with my girlfriend, you know, and I'm not a believer, it's going to be really hard for me to forgive her, especially if she said something that I didn't like or that offended me. And so I might just hold that grudge and, you know, hold it deep down and have that resentment. Um, whereas as a believer, I know resentment in the heart is not good. Yeah. And we talked about weeks ago, I think, about how, you know, you need to forgive people and don't hold onto that resentment. Um, and so that might be really difficult um, whenever it gets past the little honeymoon phase. Um, chill out. <laughs> and whenever, you know, arguments start to happen. Are y'all past that yet? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah. Aaron and um, I still haven't had a fight, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> lucky. I'm just, I'm just a joke. <laughs> That's one reason it's important. Yeah. For sure. Our marriages def or, and relationships definitely have the opportunity to show the gospel to each other and to people around us and how we treat each other for sure. Anyone else? Why are being shy tonight? What else, what, what was interesting about the text? I thought the message version was super interesting, the way they talked about it. Anything? <laughs> um, what did y'all think about where it says, who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? So in that, that part of the text is saying that we, as followers of Jesus, our bodies are a temple, right? And so, like, it's kind of, we wouldn't think about bringing idols into the church, right? Like, that's crazy, but we need to have a high view of our own bodies as living temples and who we are um, becoming partners with matters uh, a lot, it matters because um, we should be making a lot of our decisions, all of our decisions, rooted in Christ, right? And so when we enter into, well, as an individual, um, our relationship with God affects the way we spend our time, it affects the way we spend our money, it affects the way that we um, handle hard things and good things, it affects how we want to raise a family one day, right? And so we want someone who is going to be on the same page as us and have the same values as us as we pursue a relationship. Um, also, I'd say just missionary dating. Have you all heard of that term? Really bad idea. Uh, been there, done that, tried. It <laughs> does not tend to work very well because when you enter into a relationship with someone who is not running the same pace as you after the Lord, it is way easier for them to pull you down for the, for, than for you to pull them up, kind of like what Haley was saying. It is so much easier for you to get distracted um, and for them to pull you down into their ways. Um, and so that's one thing to think about. Also, you want to be in a relationship with someone who is going to push you and challenge you and make you a better person. I mean, that's what relationships or godly relationships are all about is to come together and to be able to honor the kingdom better together than you were able to do apart. And so we want someone in our lives who's going to push us and not drag us down. Um, you're not going to find uh, a perfect Christian out there. You're not a perfect Christian. So don't set that expectation. But you want someone who is equally as passionate as you are about following Jesus um, so that you can be on fire for the Lord together. Um, you want a partner who's playing to win for the kingdom, right? Uh, Sam and I have been pickleball partners a few times. We like to go, a bunch of us go out and play pickleball. And Sam has graciously chosen or allowed me to be his partner. And our level of pickleball play is quite different. And if he was trying to play to win, he would not want me on his team. Right, Sam? What? Wrong? <laughs> um, so if you have the mindset where you're playing to win for the kingdom, you want to be really intentional with the partner that you choose because that's a partnership that is supposed to last the rest of your life. And so you don't want to take that decision lightly. So our relationship with the Lord is so important to us and it should matter that our partner is passionately pursuing the Lord as well and it will affect your relationship. Um, another thing that is super important in relationships is that we have good community surrounding us as we enter into a relationship. Um, you need to have 
those deep friendships, those soul friends in your life before you're ready to enter into a relationship because you're, um, the partner that you're dating, the person that you're dating shouldn't be your soul friend right off the bat. Um, I'd even say they, they shouldn't be your, like your one person that you go to until closer to you getting engaged or maybe not even until your engagement. Um, we'll, we're going to talk more about uh, emotional, physical, and spiritual boundaries at the next Vespers. Um, but it is so important that you have your people outside of your relationship to go to um, because when you enter into a relationship, you need people in your life who are, can see without uh, rose-colored glasses on, right? Because when you enter into a relationship, when you're in the honeymoon stage, when everything's exciting, you're not going to see the red flags. You're not going to be able to see if they're transforming you for better or for worse. And so you need those people in your life that you can go to um, and say, hey, what do you think about this? I mean, honestly, when you're dating someone, your friends should be dating them alongside of you in a lot of ways. Dalton, you're giving, <laughs> it's not weird. I'm not in that way. Just to be getting to know them and observing their life alongside of you um, because you want them to be able to speak into your relationship. You need people to be able to sit you down and say, hey, Sydney, I, I really think this relationship is changing you. And um, I can see the anxiety and the lack of peace it's causing in your life. And I really think you need to let it go. And I've been there. I've had friends who have done that for me. And it was hard in the moment. Um, it's hard to let go of relationships. And it's hard sometimes to see things that people outside of your relationship can see. But trust me, and you want those friendships in your life that are willing to have those hard conversations with you. But you also want people in your life who can say like, yes, that is the type of person you should be with. I mean, the joy, like there's nothing better than having all your friends around you supporting you and excited for you to marry that person. Um, so that is super, super important. Uh, a few ways to think about how we should date um, in community is one that you should not just drop all your friends as soon as you're in a relationship. Uh, that's a huge thing. I mean, I think many of us in this room can probably attest to the fact that you've lost a friend because they got into a relationship, right? That as soon as they start dating someone, you don't ever see them anymore. They stop pursuing you as a friend and they're just poof, gone, right? And that is not the type of friend that you want to be when you enter into a relationship. Do not be that person that just drops all your friends because that relationship might not last. And then you don't want to look up a few months later and not have anyone in your life anymore, right? And you need those people still in your life to be evaluating that relationship alongside of you. So don't just drop your friends. Um, I'd also encourage you really to, um, to do a lot of things, to date alongside of your friends, to go on double dates, to hang out in groups a lot. Aaron and I, um, as we started dating, did a lot of things in groups, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, we enjoyed really getting to know each other's friend groups and merging our friends. Um, and that was a really, really special time. I think a lot of the times we think we need to spend all this one-on-one -on -one time with someone to get to know them, but you really get to know somebody a lot in how they interact in a group and how they treat other people. Uh, a fun story that I, I'm just really thankful for is that when um, at our rehearsal dinner, we had our friends come up and they were get, sharing different stories about us and about how we met and about our time in college. And one of our friends got up and shared how she really thought that she was going to lose a friend when we started dating because that's typically the norm. But she shared that through our relationship, she only gained a friend in Aaron. And that was just such a sweet moment for us to see like, man, we... We did this well. Um, we put in the work to maintain our friendships and all our friends just felt like they gained another friend. And we um, got to have this awesome 
group of people around us that were excited for us and that are still our friends and still walking alongside of us in life. Um, so, yeah, community is really, really important, guys. I can keep talking about that all night. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking in your groups of what do you think it looks like for you, whether you're in a relationship or not, hypothetical or not, to date in community. Um, is this something that you want to do with your relationship or is this a new concept for you to talk about this and how it could look like in your relationship now or a future relationship? And then we're also going to have time if you all have questions for Aaron and I specifically about our relationship, how we did dating. I also, I won't speak for Aaron, but I did dating wrong in a lot of ways before Aaron. Um, and I'm really thankful that we got to practice it and do it right together, but I made a lot of mistakes leading up to our relationship. Um, so I'm excited to, we all can ask us questions. So y'all can be thinking at your table what questions too you wanna ask us. Um, so spend a few minutes talking. Anyone wanna share what y'all talked about at your tables? Ready for David Olives. Oh, did I turn it off? There we go. Wow, it worked. Um, so I kind of started out with like, I hate the whole concept of, oh, they're my everything. And you kind of heard that. But it's like, if they're your everything, what, what else do you have? Like, don't make that person the only person you rely on for anything. Have your friends, um, like, if you need to cry about them, or if you're upset with them and you need to vent about them, are you going to vent to them about them? <laughs> that makes sense. Um, but yeah, like, and the same, like, goes for you, where if they're your, if you're their everything, like, I've been in a relationship where they relied on me for everything. Like, I was almost expected to be their Jesus because they didn't have anything else, no other friends, no other nothing. Um, and so that's not healthy for either person at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, that's going to be really disappointing yeah. in their relationship. For and sure. make sure they're spending time with their friends too, as much as, you know, I love the attention, but yeah. have friends. I remember when, um, like sometimes Aaron would choose to go hang out with the guys over hanging out with me and I'd be like, oh, are you serious? Oh, yeah. You want to hang out with them over me? But then I, I would be like, actually, no, that's awesome that he has friends that are encouraging to him and he wants to spend time with, and I should celebrate that and not be offended. So girls, don't get offended when your boyfriend wants to hang out with the bros. Anyone else want to share? So these are the two things that I thought were really like, important to talk about with relationships. If you have God at the center of your relationship and you, you have community around you, then you're setting yourself up for a really successful dating relationship. Um, I have a few other points, but before I get to those, do y'all want to ask, do y'all have any questions for Aaron or I about dating? You can come up here. This is Aaron, everybody. He's awesome. Y'all gotta make him talk. Y'all have any questions? How do you ask for help? Great question. Um, her friends had a camp out in her backyard, and I had a test the next morning. <laughs> and so I stayed up until 4 a.m. studying, because also sleeping on a tent on a hard floor is very hard. And then Sid made me coffee in the morning. And so I went back and forth trying to get her <clears throat> this coffee cup back. And um, she just started asking a bunch of questions. I was like, this would be better over a coffee date. And so. That's 
copy date. I'm more Ciego. Y'all aren't old enough to, some of you are, some of you are, some of you who are homegrown here, more Ciego. I don't even know what coffee cup, but we do have a table, our dining room table is a table from Amor Ciego. So, no, I bought it from them. Don't worry, I didn't steal it. <laughs> Jill has a question. Jill? Yeah. <laughs> well, one part was it was all during COVID. And when we, we had just gotten engaged and I was supposed to go look for wedding dress the next week and that's when everything shut down. Um, but a cool part and a challenging part is Aaron got to come home and live with us um, for the six weeks everything was shut down. Um, so he got to know my family really well. Um, him and Nathan, my brother right here, made me cry playing some board <laughs> games. But yeah, she that, that was an interesting experience. She just got caught cheating. That's why she, uh, she Yeah. Got. But uh, what was the most challenging part in our relationship? Hmm. It was like so long ago, but it really wasn't. I know, we've been married <laughs> for a year and a half now. I mean, we'll talk about this more next week, but obviously, like, boundaries are really hard in relationships. Um, and that was a conversation we were having to have constantly yeah. um, and just reevaluating all the time, like, all right, this isn't working. We've got to figure out a different plan. Um, but we brought other people into that conversation and made sure people knew what our boundaries were um, and to ask us about it, so. Uh, I think another thing too um, <clears throat> that was challenging when we were dating and still working through is learning how to communicate and communicate in a um, loving way to where you can like, have disagreements, um, but also still show that you love that person. Um, so that was, and is can still be challenging sometimes to communicate emotions and feelings uh, and those things. Yeah, Aaron and I, and you'll learn this in re relationships, but you have a lot of different communication styles and you learn that from your family in a lot of ways. And the communication style I bring in is I can be a lot and I want to talk about things right on, at the moment they're happening and process it immediately. And that's not how Aaron processes things. He needs time and space to think about it and then come back. And so I've really had to learn to respect that and give him space to process things and not force him to talk about it immediately. Um, yeah, and I think a big thing too that I had to learn is when he was upset or just more quiet that it's not my fault. I wanted to think everything was my fault and he's like, it's not always about you. <laughs> so yeah, those are a few things that we've learned. Any other questions? Dalton's coming. So how do you balance like having your own faith and then also pushing and like having the faith together? It's like having each of y'all have your own faith and following your own faith and growing, but also like having one together. Yeah, I think <clears throat> especially early on, um, you still want to have a pretty separate like faith in that you'll gradually in each stage of like I think I'll talk about it a little talk bit. About a little bit but like when you're just starting getting to know each other, still very much having separate face. Like, you're still doing your thing, they're still doing their thing. Um, not to negate, like, praying together and stuff. Yeah, that's all good. But um, you don't want to rely heavily on that other person until you, like, get further in. And then you'll start blending and merging a little bit. But even now, I'd say that uh, we still connect with the Lord in different ways at different times. Um, but just being open to learning from each other still. It is a hard thing to figure out how to bring your faith together because it feels like such a intimate thing with you and the Lord. Um, I, I mean, we were going to church together, first of all, and I feel like that's a really great step and then to have conversations about what you're learning about in church. But uh, for a while, we kind of like I talked about, maybe I forgot to say this, but I really tried the most 
vulnerable parts of the things that I was going through, and same for him, we tried to go to our girlfriend or our guy friend instead of each other really until we got engaged. And then that's kind of when we made that shift of then we were sharing the vulnerable parts of what we're going through, including our faith. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Kind of. It was hard too, a little bit learning, like just getting over the awkward stage of praying together um, <laughs> once we got married. I mean, it was kind of awkward at first and we were like, no, this needs to be important to us. And so it doesn't matter if it feels weird at first, like we're gonna just sit down and be intentional and pray together. And um, now we do it pretty regularly together and it's become a really sweet time. Sam? Uh, what habits did y'all make while dating that y'all are most thankful for now? Hmm. That's a good question. <clears throat> you think of anything else? Uh, <laughs> the first thing I thought about was working out together. <laughs> this is silly, but just like doing things that we enjoyed together and and with that, not sitting at home, um, just watching Netflix all the time. Um, that was a, a thing that, a habit we created early on in our dating relationships is we don't just sit around and watch movies all the time. And we wanna go out and do things and be active. Um, so that's been a big part of our relationship and I think it's been a really healthy thing for us as well. Um, I think um, also, like hanging out with our friends. Especially when we were dating, we were hanging out with each other's friends and now they're all kind of merged and whatnot. But um, I think setting that tone during dating that we were able to, then as we transition to marriage, that it's still, like it's really easy to make the other person like the focal point of your life, but then you lose out on like all the amazing community and the ability for other people to speak life into your marriage as well and to see, um, when you're struggling or when uh, things aren't going well that you're not always able to see clearly. So I think keeping, keeping our, our tight-knit community has definitely been a real blessing and um, helped us grow a lot. Yeah. I know too, like sometimes newlyweds can have a really hard time like being apart from each other. Uh, just they become really attached and sometimes codependent on each other. and. I think we really tried to build a habit early on in our relationship that we could be apart from each other. And now in marriage, like it's obviously good for us to be together and we don't wanna be apart a lot, but we're okay with, like if Aaron did the way the other weekend and he wasn't home all weekend, I'm fine. I don't need him to be there all the time. And what? Or a week long snowboarding trip when I had COVID, he left me to go snowboarding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but. That's a good question. Anything else? If you think of any more, the next Vespers, we can have some more Q&A time if y'all want. But uh, you can stay up here for a second if you want to. Do you want to add anything else to what I'm saying? Or are you done? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's a big deal. Aaron doesn't like to talk in front of people, so. Yeah. Um. So just a few other points. We could spend all semester talking about dating, um, but this is really just to start the conversation. So start the conversation. If you have something that you want to talk to me or Aaron or Bailey about, like any of us um, would love to talk to you, or just to start the conversations with your friends, with the people that you're sitting around at the table. How do we do this better? How do we hold each other accountable? Um, but a few points that I also wanted to just throw out there is I really believe that there's not just the one out there for you. Um, some of you might have grown up thinking that there is only one person out there for you and you have to find that perfect person. And I just want you to take that pressure off. Um, there are a lot of great people that you could be with. Uh, marriage and relationships take work and when you enter into a relationship with someone even in marriage that person is going to change over time and so there's not just this one person um, that is perfect out there for you but you want to find someone who like we've talked about who is is grounded and find their identity in the Lord um, 
and who you enjoy being around and who you have things in common with and um, chemistry. You, you want to find someone you enjoy doing life with, but take some pressure off. Um, this book, Outdated, I haven't read it all, but um, what I have read is super good, and it talks about, um, he, he talks a lot about how we put too much pressure that we have to find the one. Um, so I would encourage you to read this book. Uh, you can come take a picture of it afterwards if you want, or if you need help buying one, I'd be happy to get you one. Uh, so then, next point is that we shouldn't just be dating for fun. Uh, dating is something in our culture that our culture has told us that you just date whoever you want, ca date casually, uh, just mess around. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that's a really uh, bad idea because you're giving away parts of your heart, parts of um, you to someone, and you want to not take that lightly. And so you don't, I'm not saying you have to marry the person next week, like you can take your time in dating, uh, but as soon as you realize you're not, you don't see a future with the person that you're dating, that you don't see marriage somewhere down the line, don't be in that relationship. Break up with them. Um, it's better for both of you. And then real quickly, I wanted to say that there is um, a purpose in each stage of the relationship. We have the talking stage, which I really believe that that stage is just to start to get to know someone and decide, do I want to continue to get to know this person? And am I willing to be associated with that person? I think that's a big question to ask is when you become boyfriend and girlfriend, when you put a label on your relationship, then you are then associated with that person. And if the person has um, a bad reputation or they are not a follower of Jesus, you really need to think about, like, do I want to be connected to this person? Um, and then dating is really when you're intentionally getting to know someone. Uh, and this is a fun season that you should be creative in and do fun things and not just sit around and watch TV, like go out and do road trips to Austin or get outside, um, really get to know that person and let the people around you get to know that person. Figuring out that if you have the same values, if you um, enjoy doing the th same things, if you love Jesus and um, if that person loves other people well, those are the things that you're evaluating in um, a dating relationship. And then getting engaged is really you up that commitment level and that's when you start to practice um, and prepare for marriage in committing to each other um, and you s start to ha make decisions together about your future. And then marriage is obviously when you become one and you are now trying to encourage each other as one to love God and love people better. So that's each stage of the relationship. And then last thing is some of you might be wondering, how do you know if I should keep pursuing uh, this relationship with this person that I'm in? Um, I said that question really weird. How do I know if I should keep pursuing a relationship with this person? And I would encourage you to really think about, uh, is this relationship bringing peace into my life? Is there peace surrounding this relationship? Or is it breeding chaos and anxiety and stress in my life? Uh, I would encourage you to ask the people around you, what do you think about this relationship? And then lastly, uh, Philippians 4, 8, have it up on the screen. This, this is a verse that's been really helpful to me as I'm praying through any decision. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So Paul is saying, these are the things that we're supposed to be setting our minds on. And so as I'm thinking through a decision, I'm like, do, is this, or do these words describe this decision? Is this decision going to be honorable and pure and excellent and lovely and praiseworthy and admirable? Those are the things that I want to describe the decision that I'm making. Or if, if that does not describe and is not a yes, then I know like 
man, this, this isn't where the Lord wants me to go. And um, then you back out. <laughs> so that's all I have for you guys tonight. Um, 